Well, you don't have to hand over to me. I'll just introduce the speaker once again. Great pleasure to have him, and he's going to speak for about 35 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to the Islamic Society, Pakistan Society, Complex Research Group, and yourself, uh, Professor or Doctor, whichever one. Either. It's interesting. Um, I should probably first apologise that, uh, to specifically to Anis, that because of me that you had to face certain difficulties for this event when it comes to Kashmir, um, and when it came to me. So for that I apologise. Uh, the controversy surrounding this event, if uh, people are aware, is because allegedly uh, um, we are people from Kashmir that speak against the uh, atrocities are agents, or we are anti-national, or we are anti-Hindu, or we are terrorists, or whatever the excuses are. Uh, it's indicative of what the situation of Kashmiris is. Uh, when people that speak uh, academically, people that speak passionately, people that speak factually, are silenced. Um, and it's not just about the silence, it's also about the elimination. Uh, when I say elimination, I, I use this word purposefully because murder is far too common. I'm saying elimination, and forcibly being disappeared uh, inside Kashmir. Um, but the fact that you took a stand, um, the Islamic society took a stand, Pakistan society came on board, um, and of course the conflict research group is also affiliated. Not only do I thank you, but the people of Kashmir thank you as well. Uh, it is very important that you acknowledge that we thank you for this because it takes great courage um, to stand firm in the face of fascism uh, in today's day and age. So we genuinely <coughs> thank you. Um, the attempts to silence Kashmiris <coughs> is a very, well, specifically this Kashmiri, is a very small example, a small anecdote in the history of Kashmir. How did we get to this? How did we get to a position where uh, uh, Kashmiris, be they coming to the LSE or going to the United Nations or sitting at home using Twitter and Facebook, how did it come to be, in, how did we get to this position where we are silenced, where uh, we are completely downtrodden? Um, I could start from 1846. Uh, I've only got 35 minutes, so I know that. Um, where the British sold us for about half a million pounds and a few goats. A few goats. Uh, I could start from 1931, when the people rose up, probably for the first time, against the Maharaja. Uh, what we would probably call, uh, in the English language, a king. Or I could start from 1947, when India invaded Kashmir. Uh, history lesson could be very, very heavy at this time, and I'm very well aware of the time limitations. What's important to know, though, nothing has changed. Be it from 1846, 1931, 1947, 1987, 2016, or from 2019 when India illegally annexed uh, and absorbed Kashmir into the main territory of India. Um, nothing has changed whatsoever. We're still going, now some people talk about a decolonization process. We're not going through a decolonization process. The process doesn't exist. We have just been recolonized. Once the British left, the Indians came in. Um, we'll get to why they came in a little later on. The only reason that there's a million uh, uh, military personnel inside Kashmir is not for any reason except to occupy the land. Let it be clear. Uh, they're not there for uh, 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 peace. They're not there for security. And they're not certainly there for our protection. Uh, and I say one million specifically for this reason. At the height of the uh, military presence in Iraq, and Afghanistan, uh, I think the numbers touched close to a quarter of a million, combined. We have a million jackboots on the ground. Calculate how many bullets that is, how many grenades that is, how many tanks there are, how many violations there could possibly be. Um, now, the historical aspect, partition. India and Pakistan created, Muslim majorities were supposed to go with Pakistan, Hindu majorities were supposed to stay with India. Um, Three specific cases, Junagar, Hyderabad, and Kashmir. Uh, one state had a Muslim uh, a ruler, but a Hindu majority. The Indian said, no, they have to come with India because the population is Hindu. Another one declared independence. India said, absolutely not, that's not going to work for us, so you're coming with us as well. In our case, we had a Muslim majority with a Hindu ruler. 
the population did not want to accede to India. They didn't believe in that. Um, and of course the Maharaja, for his entire family, had been subjugating the people, had been oppressing the people for about over a century, since they were bought out for a few goats and about half a million pounds. Um, now, Nehru was the one, the first Prime Minister of India was the one that took Kashmir to the United Nations. It wasn't us, it wasn't Pakistan, it wasn't the UK that caused the problem, it was India, first Prime Minister. And when he made speeches in regards to Kashmir, it's not me saying this, look at the history books, he said that we do not believe in forced marriages. And he also said that even if it pains us, even if it pains us and the people of Kashmir decide not to accede to, Kashmir, uh, to India, we will have to go with the wishes of the people. So there is, there is a fundamental uh, principle already laid down, not by us, not by the United Nations, but by India in itself. It's funny how the oppressor was the one that went to the United Nations, and then it's the oppressor that is breaking those same resolutions. 18 resolutions have been passed in Kashmir. 18. And India, India is the one that is uh, uh, um, negating those res resolutions, but also uh, in contravention of uh, the Geneva Conventions, which I'll come to in a bit. Now, whether those resolutions exist or not is relevant. Now, I, I know it's... A lot of conflicts they revolve around the principle of uh, uh, the United Nations Charter, the Human, the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, international law. I say to you, it doesn't make a difference. Ours is a moral cause. If you eliminate the legal, you eliminate the political. Ours is still a goddamn moral cause. We are being oppressed. We have not been given the right to self determination. Nobody has asked us what we want. Uh, it's like being a, a divorce child. Now, uh, the, I mentioned the international law simply for this reason, is that the international human rights law, uh, some argue that the basis of it is the United Nations, uh, United Nations uh, Human Rights Declaration. Now, Article 1 of that is everybody has the right to be free, the right to choose how they want to exist. Now, there's about, if I'm not mistaken, there are 30 uh, articles in that charter. When the first one, the very first principle, is being negated. You can imagine what, uh, how, how badly India is trampling on the other 29. Um, the Geneva Convention and the Additional Protocols, uh, I mention this specifically because nations such as India are bound by international law, international human rights law. They are bound by the Geneva Conventions. And if you, con if you go in contravention of them, there should be, con I'm not saying there are consequences, I'm saying there should be consequences. But who is going to take that up? I can't. I'm not a nation. I don't represent a country. Uh, uh, so we are dependent on the ICJ, the ICC, maybe even the British government, if they gave uh, some hope to the people of Kashmir that they would do something, but that doesn't exist. Now, uh, Geneva Conventions aside, August 15th, 2019, Genocide Watch issued an alert. Genocide Watch issued an alert saying that the 10 stages of genocide have been completed, so we will be imminently seeing genocide happening inside Indian occupied Kashmir. That will happen in 2019. In 1947, we already witnessed one genocide, it was called the Jumbo Genocide, where a quarter of a million people, London Times, uh, back ten, uh, in those days it was called the London Times, declared that a quarter of a million people were massacred within days. A quarter of a million people. Within days. If that's not a genocide, tell me what is. Um, and this is immediately after the partition. So while, while uh, people should have been thinking about how to build their nations, how to survive, what kind of economy they're going to have, one of the first acts that they committed was uh, a war crime inside the Indian occupied Kashmir. Now, whatever's happened inside Kashmir is an ancient history. It's happened in every single one of our lifetimes. Now, I may have touched, touched upon 1947 and the partition, but I'm telling you, that it has happened in our lifetimes. Now, I may be a little bit older than some of you, uh, um, but I put it to you that you have all, in your lifetimes, you may not have witnessed this, it's happening somewhere, that uh, we have had hundreds of thousands dead, destruction of property and businesses in the billions, tens of thousands raped, innumerable enforced disappearances, thousands of mass and unmarked graves, human shields, torture, bullets, pellets, Orphans, widows, half-widows, cyber cells, media blackouts, illegal draconian laws, 
false flag operations, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, genocide, demographic change, settler colonialism, vacant stage encounters, the longest internet shutdown in history, and the list is endless. Again, this, is not, this has not happened in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. I'm saying it, it has. But it continues to happen. This isn't history. It's happening right now. I can tell you this. Okay, we're in December. In November, at least 17 people were killed. That's, record, that's just what we were able to record. Remember, it's a conflict zone. Not everything can be uh, accurately recorded. Now, maybe I'm making all this up. Maybe the Indian lobby was right about me. And that's why they tried to shut down this event. And maybe it's true that Kashmir is a terrorism and security problem. I'll admit, Kashmir is a terrorism and security problem. Not us. We aren't the problem. Bipin Rawat. If you'd be kind. Bipin Rawat, Chief of Defense Staff. He laments that I wish that the people of Kashmir that were throwing stones at us picked up arms against us, because then it would be easier to kill them. The Chief of Defense Staff of the Indian Army, one of the largest armies in the world. Army officers screaming on national TV to rape the Kashmiri women. Use it as a weapon of war. Asya and Nilofar in 2009 were found in my village, in not my, my village, my town, um, in a shallow pool, in a shallow uh, river, uh, and uh, it was declared that they had drowned. I mean, the water was literally, they say it was about thumb deep, and it was declared that they had drowned. The autopsy showed, before it was, er before it was erased, the autopsy showed that they had been raped and gang raped and then thrown, dragged and then thrown into the river by the Indian military. Mubina Ganai. If you have weak stomachs, I, I really do apologize, but I'm, I'm going to go into detail because you need, really need to know. And I assume that a lot of you are passionate about the Palestinians, yes? Yes. yes. You're passionate about the Rohingya, yes? Yes. yes. And what happened in Iraq, you're passionate about that? Yes. What's happening in Yemen? Yes. Then you need to listen to what is happening in Saikish. Mubina Ghanai was a bride, new bride. Uh, and this happened in the 80s. Um, she went with her aunt, so the wedding is over and she's going to her husband's house. You can only imagine, I don't know how many people here are married, but you can only imagine what uh, um, uh, a woman would be going through, the kind of emotions that she's going through. Uh, um, going to a new home, meeting her husband, and uh, 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 meeting a new family. That bus was stopped by the Indian military. The women were dragged out. Specifically, Mubina and her aunt, who were dressed very, very beautifully because she's, she's a bride, were taken to the field, raped and gang-raped by the Indian military. And then the people that were inside the bus were shot. Not all of them, but a lot of them were shot and they were killed. Next slide, please. Aispa Ban. I don't know if anybody remembers her. Eight years old. Taken to a temple. Raped and gang raped by civilians. Civilians, not the army. And then the way that she was killed was a big boulder was thrown on top of her head, crushing her. You can only imagine what she would have been going through those few days between the uh, 10th and 17th of January 2018. How many times she would have been calling out for her mother or her father? You know, I, I recently. Um, my wife and I recently had a child. And while I was uh, looking at these case studies, now I, I've done these before, I've seen these before, I've gone to the ground, I've witnessed them. But the day that I had my child, and then the day that I started writing up these things again, it's, uh, it's a new feeling for me. And I wish it nobody. She, uh, the, the, the worst part of that case, I mean, it's, it's terrible, but the other aspect of this case was that the people that were involved in the rape, the abduction, and the gang rape of, of this little beautiful girl, uh, they were bailed by the BJP from jail. Protests had come out onto the streets asking them to be freed. Uh, Tamanna. Tamanna was nine months pregnant. I've highlighted this. 
and you can read it for yourselves, but uh, she was nine months pregnant, raped and gang raped again. She gave birth to a son with a broken arm three days later. These are the realities that we have to go through. These are the case studies that we see every single day. Uh, I, I, I don't think that many people will be familiar with these case studies, and I would urge you to get yourselves acquainted with what is happening in Saint Kashmir, simply because there aren't enough of us that not only know about it, but then can actively talk about it. Because clearly, uh, I don't know how long I'm still going to be on the circuit of speaking before I get shut down, so the responsibility lies on you to do what I may not be able to do. Um, next slide, please. Two entire villages of women aged between the ages of 8 and 80 were raped and gang raped in the villages of Gunan and Bashpur. Entire village from the ages of 8 to 80. Uh, the reason I'm putting these up is because this is, I'm not making this up. I wish I was. This, and the funny thing is, The Wire is not a Kashmiri news channel or a newspaper. It isn't Pakistani, it isn't British, it isn't sponsored by the CIA. It's Indian. It's them saying this, not me. Next one, please. Uh, Hiba Nisad was 18 months old, sitting in her mother's lap when the Indian army decided to shoot pellets, tiny, tiny little pellets, into, uh, uh, into the home, which permanently blinded Hiba in her right eye. Permanently. She's 18 months. Uh, and the, uh, the left eye, pretty dark. She, she can barely see through it. Now, uh, what's she going to understand about what pretty and pink means? But she can't even distinguish between colors anymore. Next slide, please. In Shamushtak. And the one, I think the next one instead. Yeah. Blinded in both eyes. Pellets went so, I mean, it wasn't just over her face, into her mouth. She wanted to be a doctor. And now she needs permanent medical care for the rest of her life. Next slide, please. And again. Ayad. Um, <laughs> three years old. He was walking with his grandfather, uh, or he was in his car. They were dragged out of the car, his grandfather was shot at point blank range. And this picture is not Ayad, uh, uh, not understand. He was placed by the military on the chest, on his, on his grandfather's chest, because they wanted to do some kind of propaganda. Next slide, please. Parveena Ahangar. Parveena Ahangar is considered to be the Iron Woman of Kashmir. She spent nearly 30 years looking for her son. 30 years looking for her son, who, went, uh, uh, who was enforcedly disappeared. Um, now she runs APDP, the Association of Parents of Disappeared Persons, um, who helps other parents uh, um, campaign and urge um, the international bodies to at least uh, uh, engage with the Indian forces to uh, at least give back the bodies of the, I mean, look, if you're, if you're going to enforcibly disappear people, that's fine. If you're going to kill them, that's fine. At least give back the bodies so that we can give them the burial. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Guardian. Um, this is an extract, I think, from uh, um, TRT, but it's from The Guardian. Five-year-old Samir Rah. He went out uh, to... Just out. Kids, what do they do? They go out. Um, and the story is that he went out to buy some sweets and he saw that there was a procession going on, but they were military as well. They grabbed him, they beat him, played with his head like a football, and if you're familiar with what a, la what a lati is, it's a, it's a big wooden stick that the police in the subcontinent use to, to beat uh, uh, protesters. They shoved it down his throat so hard and so far that they broke his back teeth, and then they <coughs> stamped on it, on his throat, killing him. Five years old. Next slide, please. Uh, the Quint, Nasir. Four-year-old Nasir was captured because he was a threat to, to the Indian state. His eye was punctured and sand was poured into it. I, you can ask me why, I have no idea. Why, why to a four-year-old? Why to anybody? But why specifically to a four-year-old? Next slide, please. Alanda. Alanda was picked up, he was a, he was a shepherd, uh, had nothing to do with anything. He was picked up from the Indian forces. His, uh, uh, he was tortured, his legs, uh, legs were amputated, and then he was force-fed his own flesh. 
Next slide, please. We're coming to an end, I apologize. Uh, the, ah, the independent. This happened just uh, um, a couple of years ago, in 2019. Uh, fake staged encounters in Kashmir are very common. Uh, there was another fake encounter that happened, and uh, uh, Aldaf Bhatt was murdered by the Indian forces. Uh, and when his daughter confronted the armed forces, asking them, why did you kill my father? Uh, there's a video to this, which uh, I don't need to play, but um, they laughed at her when she asked them, why did you kill my father? And they just laughed at her. Next slide, please. Is that the end of the slide? That's fine. Uh, now, uh, one more thing I wanted to talk about. The New York Times reported in 2019 uh, and 2019 is important to us because August 5th, 2019 is when India illegally annexed, I mean, they were already occupied, but they annexed and absorbed Kashmir into the uh, territory of India. Um, and article that was specifically called Article 370 and 35A, which they abrogated. Uh, during that time, they abducted, I don't know, maybe 30,000 people, 12,000 children, again, reports from Indian uh, uh, civil society. Um, and in fact, the masajids, some masajids, uh, especially in my hometown, the loudspeakers were turned on, and the people that they had arrested had been tortured under the loudspeaker to instill fear and terror among the population, so that nobody else would come out to protest. Uh, now, all of these, you can go, I said that, you know, maybe we are a security threat. Maybe the four-year-olds and five-year-olds and 18-year-olds are security threats. The reality is the truth, truth is a security threat to India, which is why they clamped down on journalists, they clamped down on our political leaders. Uh, 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 Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, he was, uh, uh, I guess, over the age of 90, who had spent nearly most of his life in jail. Uh, his home had been turned into a sub-jail. He was denied medical treatment. Sehrai, Ashraf Sehrai, he was also denied medical treatment. Unnecessarily jailed. And denied medical treatment, they were essentially murdered in jail. Uh, we continue to have women, uh, female uh, political prisoners, as well as male political prisoners, Asya Andradi, uh, Qasim Fakhru, Yasin Malik, um, Masrat Alam, who is now the leader of the resistance. So, uh, journalists, I, I want to specifically speak about Asif Sultan. Asif Sultan has spent the last four years in jail for writing an article. I'm not joking, I mean, you can really look these things up. Take down all the names and look them up. Asif Sultan wrote an article about something. And he was lodged in jail, and he's been in jail for the last four years. His daughter was six months old when he went to jail. She barely recognizes her father. Now, our freedom is so is such a threat to India that we even have draconian laws inside Kashmir. We have something called the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. Listen carefully, the Armed Forces Special Powers Act. It's an act that is specifically dedicated to the armed forces that gives them impunity, complete impunity. They can do whatever the hell they like inside Kashmir, commit whatever atrocity, whatever war crime, whatever crime, whatever crime against humanity they feel like committing, they'll never be charged. We have the PSA, the Public Safety Act, where you can be lodged in jail for two years without trial. Without trial. And we call it a revolving door uh, law. Because so many people go in, and after two years when they're supposed to be released, they're charged with another act, for no reason. Now, uh, even I am a security threat, which is why this event was... Uh, uh, well, they attempted to sabotage the event, but thankfully, uh, uh, Islamic Society, Pakistan Society, and uh, the yes uh, came together. The LSC came together and allowed us to carry on. Um, I've had my uncle killed just a few months ago. My cousins have been abducted, tortured. My family don't talk to me anymore because their phones are traced, they're tracked, all, all communications inside Kashmir are tracked. You know that WhatsApp message that you normally get when you message somebody and it says, all communications are encrypted? <laughs> That's not true. But at least not in Kashmir. At least not in Kashmir. I don't know about the UK. Uh, so, why? Why us? <clears throat> Akhanbad. When the, during the times that the Nazi Germany was falling, its destruction was imminent, is the time when the RSS was being created. The foundations of the RSS, which is the parent organization of the BJP, which is the organization that is in power right now, had formed in the 1920s, modeling itself over, the, uh, uh, over Nazi Germany. Um, 
the, the uniform of the RSS, the salute of the RSS, uh, the, the vision is all inspired by Nazi Germany. Now, what is the RSS? A radical neo-colonial right-wing fascist group that have an imperial expansionist plan. Uh, they aspire to create a pan-Hindu nation under one party, as they believe they are a superior race, the Aryan race, uh, and they want to impose cultural nationalism. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's identical to the Nazis. I'm not making this up. Read the literature. Identical to what the Nazis had uh, uh, wanted. The expansionist program called Akhand Bharat does not, is not limited to India. They believe that Bangladesh uh, belongs to them, uh, Myanmar belongs to them, Burma, Nepal, Pakistan, uh, Iran, to the extent that they believe even Saudi Arabia belongs to them. They even call the Holy Kaaba in Mecca, that we do tawaf around, that, that we pray towards, they call that the Makeshwar Mahadev Temple. And they believe it is uh, one, of their, one of their holy shrines. Everything is a holy shrine for them. Uh, if anybody is familiar with the, uh, what's happening inside India, I mean, you know, a lot of lynchings uh, because of beef, because you're Muslim, or what, for whatever reason, they have started to change the terminologies of things. So, the Taj Mahal. Everybody's familiar with the Taj Mahal? No, it's not going to be called that anymore. It's going to be called the Teju Mahalaya Temple. Uh, Qutub Minar is a massive building, uh, a tower inside uh, in India, Qutub Minar. It's going to be called the Vishnu Stam Temple. Um, and we had the Babri Masjid. It's it's it, a massive case inside India where uh, the Indians said that you know this is where our I don't know which god was born there or some mandir. They want to make a, a temple there, destroy that, and they're going to call it the Ram Mandir. From from the uh, uh, Babri Masjid, they're going to call it the Ram Mandir. Even the judiciary has been given complete autonomy by the BJP uh, uh, to institutionalize and legalize the BJP's version of terror. Right? And I'm openly saying that it is terror. It has to be called terrorism. You can't call it anything less. Um, now, I know that I've, I've probably gone over time. I have no idea. Uh, More than five minutes. <laughs> I'll come to a close. Um, a reminder. The world intervened when uh, the genocide and the Holocaust happened uh, by the Nazis. When Rwanda, uh, the, the ethnic cleansing and genocide happened in Rwanda, well, the world said never again. Whatever is happening in Palestine, people are saying the world should not ever tolerate such a thing again. Why, Kashmir? Why are we still pending? Why does nobody ever know about this? Uh, for how long are you going to, are you going to specifically, you people, the public, are going to tolerate the atrocities that are being committed in the Kashmir, and not know about it. That is the worst part. It isn't so much necessary that you may be able to act for the people of Kashmir, but at least have the ilm of it. Um, so Srebrenica is another example that people said never again. And you have uh, monuments, you have uh, 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 every year they commemorate what happened in Srebrenica. So I'll close with uh, um, a couple of anecdotes that are personal to me. Uh, when I used to travel to Kashmir, I used to in, in, in the capital, Srinagar, I used to go through a particular area and there was a mother that every single day that she would go to the school and come back empty-handed without her son. And I asked a guy, you know, why does she keep on making this trip to the school? I mean, what, what's she doing? Is she dropping food? The story goes that her son had gone to school and never came home. About now, when I think about it, it would have been about 16 years ago, 17 years ago. She goes to that school every single day in the hope that maybe one day her son might turn up, that he might come out of school. She has trauma. She has psychological trauma. She cannot believe that her son is still missing. What am I supposed to tell her if I see her? That what the world has done? Because people inside Kashmir stand for Palestine. We stand for the Rohingya. In fact, we have, uh, uh, um, we have refugees inside Kashmir that we've welcomed. We've even had some Afghan refugees that we've welcomed. But specifically, I talk about Palestine only because several years ago, when there was yet again another attack on Gaza, and the international world and all the public, they stood up and they protested in the hundreds of thousands in London, in New York, in Madrid, in Tokyo, wherever it may be. It was in Kashmir, the only place in the world where a person was killed for protesting for the people of Gaza. The only person in the world was a young boy that was killed. Um, now I'll, I'll end here because there's far too much more that I want to do. Uh, but if I can ask you to play that video, it's very, very, very short, maybe 30 seconds. And if anybody has any questions,
qualms or questions of what is it that the Kashmiris really want? Because essentially, I know I often get this question, what is it? Yasir uh, had a tear gas shot to his head. Um, he'll tell you. Azadi means freedom. Even in that condition, the only thing that he's competent enough to do, and with a smile on his face, despite what has happened to him, is say Azad. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mouz Emil, for that talk. Perfect timing, which means we've plenty of time for questions. We've got a roving mic. So put up your hand if you want to ask a question, and hopefully the microphone will. There's one over there, first person. Thank you, uh, sir. We are guests, so it's my duty to welcome you. I'm a student of MSc. Uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, your presentation, second slide, provided quote unquote that the general of the Indian Army. Like, can you name that general? Because I am not aware this any of the general. Huh? Chief Defence Staff Bipin Rawat. Uh, no, he was not there in the defense, in the TV9 news thing. In the live debate? Uh, yeah. He was an Indian officer. It evades my mind, which is why that I haven't been able to write because his name. Because the photo there. that is there, so he is not present there. I can show you the video if you want. Okay, uh, sure. Uh, second... Uh, Would you like to see the video? No, no I would surely you can send it across. Do you, do you doubt any of the other content that has been said? Uh, just one more thing, sir. I, uh, do you doubt any of the content that has been said so far, with evidence? Uh, not uh, this one. I, not doubt, but few things that you said. Uh, well, I will come to that. Like two questions first, because I am a law student and. Sorry, are... sorry. One question, please. Okay, one question. Uh, the you said. Uh, as the Indian occupied Kashmir. So, do you agree that after the Indian Independence Act of 1947, uh, the the princely states were given option either to uh, be independent or accede to either of the uh, domain, maybe Pakistan or India. Uh, so, Hari Singh, who was the legal uh, king by that time, uh, was still in consideration. But in October 1947, Pakistan forces came and invaded. But uh, Mr. Hari Singh, uh, King Hari Singh approached India for help. But India said, until and unless you don't sign an instrument of accession with us, you can't send. It was only after that that the Indian army went into Kashmir and did that. So, uh, occupation of uh, Pakistan. Is there a question? Uh, yes. Is, do you agree that uh, Pakistan occupied Kashmir is also a reality or just the like, terminology is Indian occupied Kashmir? Because they're exists an instrument of accession and me as a law student need to know the validity of the instrument of accession which the British government and Indian Independence Act 1947 referred to. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the question. Do you want to answer? Do you want to take more? Uh, yeah, sure, take more. A few more questions then behind him. 
Hi, thank you so much for changing the lives of this matter. Um, so you mentioned the self-determination of the Kashmiri people, and um, the means by doing so uh, were by the UN determined to be uh, a, a referendum by the Kashmiri people. However, after the regrettable constitutional changes made by India in the recent years, and now the flooding of India by uh, Indian, well, Kashmir by Indian citizens would mean such a referendum would inevitably result in an Indian favoured uh, outcome. And what would you say is the solution to this, if any? Behind him. Let's just take three, right. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. I was hoping if you could shed light on the current, the arrest of Purim Purvis and the impact on the Kashmiri civil society and what else could um, students Uh, in regards to the first question, uh, no, uh, instrument of accession is disputed. Uh, Alistair Lamb's book, Victoria Schofield's book, you can uh, have, a, have a glance at them. I would strongly, strongly recommend to most of the people, including your law students, so I would hope that uh, nationalism is not your priority, that the, the education of law would be. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. For the record, I wasn't, I wasn't point scoring, it was, I was being genuine that uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for those people that study law because you can get a lot of clarity from it. Um, and one of the most important things as any student of, of any uh, discipline is to break down the preconceived notions and ideas that already exist. Um, I also assume that you're very, very familiar with journalists Journalists like Arnab Goswami um, and, and the kind of rhetoric that they use. The Indian narrative, look, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the Indian narrative. They can have that say. But the problem is that you have to ask the people of Kashmir. The instrument of accession is disputed. Uh, nobody's seen the original document, number one. Number two is that the dates signed and what had happened, historians that have calculated of where he was, he was in Jammu. The document was signed the day after that they claimed that it was signed. Number, and... The other thing about in regards to uh, um, the tribal invasion, the, which tribes, where, who asked them to come? I mean, it's it's on surface the narrative that you're speaking. I know it very, very, very well because these are the things that we have to counter every single day. But if you really, genuinely want to delve into the matters um, of of particularly the historical aspect, the and I didn't mention anything because in 30 minutes there's only so much you can say, but the tribals were invited. Azad Kashmir, what you call POK, Pakistan occupied Kashmir, what we call Azad Kashmir, they liberated themselves. Uh, remember, the World War II had just finished, and a lot of those people that, had, uh, uh, that were living in uh, Kashmir or the NWFP, in those days it was called the NWFP, Northwestern Frontier Province, had just come back from war. They were battle hardened. And for them, it was a matter of liberating people that did not want to be with India. People that had the aspirations of a, whether we like it or not. I haven't mentioned religion anywhere yet, whether we, particularly Islam. Whether we like it or not, the people of Kashmir were majority Muslims. They naturally, their natural instinct, if you ask about Mirwais at the time who was a leader, if you ask about the, the Muslim conference at the time, they all wanted to accede to Pakistan. Not all of them, but a majority of them. Some wanted independence. But as I mentioned, in Junagad, uh, sorry, in Hyderabad, the, he wanted it, the, the Maharaja there, he wanted independence. There was a forceful occupation of Hyderabad. So uh, I appreciate the question, but I think there is a lot more underneath the surface than what the Indian media and the Indian rhetoric uh, suggests. Part two, in regards to the demographic change, that's a very good question, uh, because... Uh, <coughs> Sheikh Jarrah, people are familiar, familiar with what happened, what, what's been happening there. Um, the, the land, I mean, what's happening in Palestine, generally speaking, land is being occupied and uh, settlers are coming in. You call it, the technical language is settler colonialism to force demographic change. That is exactly what is happening inside Kashmir. 2019, the abrogation of Article 317 and uh, 35A, when we say that India was annexed, or sorry, Kashmir was annexed and illegally 
um, absorbed into the Indian Union. The laws that protected Kashmiris, protected Kashmiris uh, land is now gone, we, meaning that anybody can go to Kashmir and buy land. Anybody can go and reside inside Kashmir. A bit like if uh, you know settlers went into uh, into the Gaza Strip or into other areas of Pakistan. If a plebiscite, and I'm sure that one day India would agree to a referendum inside Kashmir, but only after there has been a demographic change. And we've already seen that. Uh, nearly before August 5th, 2019, I think there were estimated about half a million migrants. After the domicile certificate, that was the number of domicile certificates issued inside Kashmir is around three million. So it, it's happening. In regards to the uh, uh, civil society, the impact of civil society inside uh, occupied Kashmir and what you can do, and particularly in regards to Kurum Parvez, Kurum Parvez has been in jail for a couple of years now. He uh, authored, he's part of JKCC, the Jammu Kashmir Coalition of Civil Societies. The documents that he produces, the research that he does, is quoted directly by the United Nations Human Rights Co uh, Commission. Two reports were issued in 2018 and 2019, quoting him, quoting his work directly. What is he doing? Research. Publishing facts. He's in jail. If people actually want to do something for Kashmir, one of the most important things, before you act, before you go out into the streets and protest, is learn. Ilm. Get that knowledge. Find out what is happening from authentic sources. Maybe I'm not authentic. Like I said, in, in, I think after five minutes of speaking, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm the liar. Do your own research. From authentic sources. From uh, uh, original, authentic uh, in indigenous Kashmiris that will tell you directly what is happening to them. Um, and then, of course, uh, when, when people ask me questions, how can we as a society, as Islamic society, as Pakistan society, as Palestine society, show solidarity? What do you people do for Palestinians? What people do for the Rohingya? What people do for Yemen and what they did for Iraq and Afghanistan? Do for us? Nothing more, nothing less. Okay, we have another microphone, and maybe we can get some questions on this side, just after, after well, wherever you want to go. <coughs> As well, I'd like to thank you for your presentation, I think it was a beautiful presentation. Um, my question really is about the Indian narrative regarding public opinion in Kashmir. And um, so they claim that um, the turnout figures for Indian elections in Kashmir is high, and so that is a proof that um, the people of Kashmir support India. So, uh, my question basically is, what do you think about this narrative? Behind him, there's uh, another hand up there. Assalamu alaikum, thank you very much for your talk once again. Um, my question is more general and broad. Um, now, just for some pretext, a few weeks ago, I was at my, my grandparents and we were watching the film Mission Impossible, and near the end of the film, like, with no real relevance, Kashmir ends up coming up in the film, like Mission Impossible, Tom Cruise stuff. I remember some cousins, my younger cousins, who were 10 or 11 years old. They were always wondering, like, what, what is Kashmir, where is Kashmir in Europe, where? they didn't actually know. I remember thinking to myself, like, what do I actually say to them, like, what country do I say, etc. Because before they were talking about Berlin and Moscow, whatever. And so I was thinking, like, what do I actually say here? And so I think more generally, like how do we educate people more on this matter? Um, you're always saying, like, Israel and Palestine, and that's talked about a lot more. So how do we get more people educated and involved in this matter? Because obviously it's super important, and it's very important to actually talk about um, as much. Thank you. Two at the back there, just one on the left, and, and that lady at the very back. So, uh, I have a comment and a question. So, my comment is, as far as I understand, the agenda of the talk was to incite the passion of students by highlighting specific cases of violence by Indian Army. And I'm sure someone can give a two-hour talk about violence unleashed, unleashed upon Bangladeshis by Pakistan Army in 1991. <laughs> and my question is, in your talk, you have highlighted the Kashmir problem between India and Pakistan. So, what's the solution of all Thanks very much. And, and then at the back, you've had your hand up a long time. Okay, a bit of quiet. One more question. Um, I would like to ask, um, of course, as this is an ISOC event, this 
I think what's important to highlight is that this isn't um, a Kashmiri issue or a Pakistani issue or an Indian issue, it's a Muslim issue. And, um, you know, what do we as Muslim youth need to be doing to enact actual change? Because you've mentioned Palestine, Yemen, the Uyghur genocide, so we know it's a common rhetoric um, that there's oppression of Muslims globally. So what does actual change look like for us as Muslim, Muslim youth, you know, in an institution where we will go on to occupy um, positions of where we can in that change? What does that look like for us? Because, yeah, I just wanted to highlight that it's not a Kashmir issue, it's a Muslim issue, and it's Muslim-wide across the whole world. It's not just Kashmir, you know, Palestine, so yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Muslim. The narrative, people that support the elections inside Kashmir, um, what kind of elections uh, happen inside Kashmir are ones that happen under the barrel of the gun. Um, and let it, let it also be known that elections inside Kashmir are not representative of uh, the right to self-determination. They are for administrative issues. I usually don't talk about that simply because it's irrelevant to the greater scheme of things when people ask for freedom. If you had a third option, if you had political parties uh, in a row, and people who had to tick a box, and then you ask, but instead of these, which prefer freedom, overwhelmingly people would say we'd rather have freedom than have these Indian stooges and puppets uh, um, uh, dictating terms to us. The phrase was Sarat Bijli Pani, roads, electricity, and water. Those are the necessities of every single person, uh, everywhere in the world. You, there are basic amenities that people need. But that does not <coughs> supersede the, the Article 1 of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, that each person is free to decide how they wish to live. Uh, until you give us that priority, that, that mandate to decide what we want, we can have water, we can have KFC, we can have McDonald's, it's okay, but it does not supersede uh, um, the right to self-determination. How to educate people about Kashmir and how to get them involved. Um, literature, information, um, doing talks like this, in, uh, regularly in different societies, different universities. But more importantly, I'm going to reflect back to what you mentioned in regards to uh, how to enact change, because you are going to be people in positions tomorrow. Uh, it is talking to think tanks, it is talking to uh, businesses. Why businesses, somebody may ask. People that be, be able to rehabilitate victims inside Kashmir. Um, you know, we had a flood in, 2015, in 2014. Yeah, 2014 we had floods we were given stale, age-old biscuits to feed off. Um, and you have people that are victims of, of torture that need, like you saw Kalandar, who has no leg. I mean, there, there is a serious need. So fundraising is also an aspect. It's not something that I focus on. But mostly it is about the lobbying. It is about documenting evidence, collating it, and then sending it to institutions and asking them, demanding from them, to do something about it, be it think tanks that need to address the issue, who, uh, for example, Rusi and Chatham House, if you're familiar with them, uh, the British government take them seriously. They give a lot of a lot of policies formed by by Rusi. Um, in the same way, uh, the student movements we've seen, particularly with Palestine. I keep on giving the example of Palestine is because uh, we have a lot of love for, for Palestine, uh, but also we would like to think that the way that people feel for Palestine, they should feel for us. So a lot of the times that question is, you can answer yourselves because it's stuff you're already doing anyway. Uh, when it comes to being a Muslim issue, I don't disagree at all, not a single point. The only reason I tend to stay away from the words of, uh, of saying this is a Muslim issue or that it is a war on Muslim identity, that our masjids are being turned into mandirs or that our uh, traditional cloaks are being removed uh, in some places, the, the removal of the headscarf, loudspeakers where the adhan is being played is, is, you know, they demand them to be uh, destroyed. The language that we had, cultural genocide is also happening. Uh, then you get accused of being a radical Muslim terrorist extremist. So let's keep it a little bit suit and tie, and maybe uh, we might be taking it a little bit more seriously. Because that's, that's what we're fighting, right? It's not just the enemy, it's the perception war as well, unfortunately. Which is why solidarity, having solidarity with other movements, is so essential. Because we can depend on each other and rely on each other. So if they come after me, I know that the Rohingya are going to support me. 
And if they come after the Rohingya, I know that the leaders are going to support them. Um, the, the question about Bangladesh, if I was Bengali, I'd answer it. But I'm not Bengali in Kashmir. That was not my question. Um, no, it was a comment, but how am I supposed to respond to something when it came about talking about Bangladesh in the middle of a discussion about Kashmir that is being occupied by India? Um, <laughs> but, um, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the people that you know when, when you come out of here. And, I mean, my question is, what is the solution to the problem that you're having? The, the solution is simple. You give the people the right to self determination. How do you ask for the action plan? Alfred Desaius was a, a specialist um, in in the United Nations, um, and he argues that. Conflict, the best form of conflict resolution is rights to self-determination. It is the best form of conflict resolution. What harm is there, <coughs> apart from egos and, uh, you know, <coughs> it's mostly ego in my opinion, but what harm would there be by offering a referendum to people? If it can happen to the people of Scotland, when it can happen and the, and, and the people in, in the Basque region are also demanding it, why not for the people of Kashmir? It's not like we have, you know, this isn't Ukraine, Russia, right? We're not like the Ukrainians. We're nothing like the Ukrainians. We're not even like the, the Palestinians. If anything, we are as miskeen as the as the Uyghurs, or as miskeen as the as the Rohingya. We don't have anything. We are completely and utterly dependent on India. So there has to be a balance. There can never be a discussion between a knife and a neck. So when you ask about solutions, you have to. There has to be a negotiation. India has never. There's a joke in our community that the international community says that Kashmir is, uh, uh, um, you know, is an issue that needs to be discussed. And India says, nope, it's a bilateral issue between India and Pakistan. So Pakistan says, all right, fine, come to the negotiating table. It's a bilateral issue. India says, nope, it's an internal issue between us and the Kashmiris. And when the Kashmiris turn around and say, okay, fine, talk to us, they say, nope, there's no issue at all. India is never prepared to talk about Kashmir. Everything, look... Atal Bihari Vajpayee said, sky is the limit, but don't ask for Azadi. Why? I can tell a joke for that as well, but I don't prefer that. Uh, sir, one contradictory fact. Sorry, you May can't interrupt. You can't <laughs> interrupt. If you want to ask another question, put your hand up. Have you finished that answer? Yes. <laughs> so we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. But we have to get as many questions from as many sources as possible. Right in the front here. Um, do you want to? OK, so two in the front. I will get to you, but you've already asked the question. <laughs> okay. Firstly, thank you for all the thought before and mentioning all those case studies, exposing the reality of what's happening in Kashmir, as much as others might like to claim that it isn't. So my question is, is that you mentioned during the talk as well, there's been, what is it, 19 UN resolutions passed? 18, yeah? And all these kind of international... We, we propose the solutions, right, from these international IGOs, um, and these sorts of organizations to solve Kashmir. To what extent is the solution actually going to come from them? To what extent do we appeal to, for example, the Muslim world, for example, the Muslim countries to help out Kashmir? So, because um, from what I've seen so far, just, just in general, like, we all know that the UN um, and other NGOs and local organizations just do whatever in their best interest, and Kashmir is not in their best interest. Alaikum. My question is, we talked a lot about the Palestinian issue, and we know the Palestinian issue, there is armed resistance, and there are resistance on the east, there is resistance on the west. Is there any resistance in Kashmir? You mentioned it's a uh, knife to the neck. Is there anything that Kashmiri people themselves can do? And if you are discussing a solution of self referendum, what guarantee do we have that an election is actually going to be valid? and not rigged when you have a state that's occupying the land carrying out their own referendum. So are you thinking or are you proposing of having kind of a, an external body such as the UN come in, carry out that election? And if so, what do you, people you vote, I mean, what, what qualifies them to vote? Should they be born in Kashmir or is it going to be a set of colonialism and they have the right to vote? Thank you. Okay, questions over this side, maybe. Have you a microphone? Thank you for this talk. 
I had a question about how to get access to information. So I was educated in India, and organizations like Standard Kashmir, which amplify indigenous voices, are actually banned. And so there is no way to get through firewall, for example, to get information, and all of the data that we use is tracked. And so at any given point, especially as religious minorities, we can always be vulnerable for certain drawbacks and these people to know what you're doing. And so in those cases, how do we, as students and researchers, or just the general public, get access to the information that is actually closer to the truth? Okay, one more question. Maybe at the front here. Yes. First of all, thank you, sir. We are just here to learn different perspectives. We believe in the freedom of speech. So, just, like, just an opinion, like, why people are laughing at us? First of all, it, it, it sounds like a mental bullying. Yes. Like, we are here to learn. We are here to, like, learn different perspectives. So, people are laughing at Bangladeshi genocide. Like, laughing is not something like humanity. We, we are talking about humanity, right? So, guys, please try to understand each perspective. Please don't laugh when we ask questions first. Thank you. So, sir, my question is, India being, like, the... Uh, Second largest, second largest population country in the world. After Indonesia, the largest Muslim population is in India. It represents Muslims. We have the Muslim president, we have different Muslims at the different high profile positions in India. My question is, sir, why, why, we don't, why we don't talk about Muslims who have been killed by militants in Kashmir? Constable Shah Fazal, Constable Shahid Rahman, why, why don't we talk about Shah Fazal? Why don't we talk about Shah Fazal who has been the UPSC topper in India? And please, guys, please read about Shah Fazal. He is from, he's a Kashmiri, he's a Muslim, he's a UPSC topper in India, and now he's serving in Indian civil services. Please read his tweet about India. Like, India is a heaven for Muslims. Can you finish the question? My question, sir, my question is, sir, my question, my question is, sir, why don't we talk about solutions? And why people are laughing on the problems? Why people are laughing on our opinions? It's very, it's like mental bullying. We are just asking questions. And, sir, 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 please, sir, please, bro. You keep giving up comments and questions. That's my question is, my question is, to the sir who has been at guest today. Sir, Come on, you've had enough time. Sir, what do you think is a solution for Muslims in India? And how do you present yourself? You are also Indian, I believe. You are also Indian citizen, I believe. How do we appeal to the Muslim world in regards to Kashmir, uh, and how likely are we to engage them in? Look, uh, you know, Kuwait, um, some lawyers in Kuwait, they started a campaign in regards to, uh, in regards to Kashmir, in, in, sorry, not in regards to Kashmir, in regards to the Muslims inside India, the minorities inside India, what's happening to them. Um, and, and it went pretty well. Uh, they started campaigns to boycott Indian goods. Uh, Malaysia, uh, uh, Mahathir Muhammad, he, he was, at the time, he was the Prime Minister of Malaysia. He issued a decree that uh, no more palm oil would be sold to India. That didn't last very long, but it was a symbolic gesture that there is uh, some support. The reality is economics plays a massive factor in a lot of these things. Uh, India is undoubtedly um, a rising tiger. It has a huge economic potential. Um, it also has a lot of internal problems as well. Uh, but, but when we talk about the Muslim world, there, there is a lot of, whether, whether we like this or not, whether you're going to, 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 to um, hate me for this or not, there is a lot of hypocrisy among our Muslim leaderships. And I don't mean necessarily at the top in, in government, I'm talking about even within our institutions and organizations in the UK and the US. Uh, there is a lot of hypocrisy that they may talk about one cause but not talk about the other cause because they don't want to, they need to appease a certain type of uh, um, either a vote base, vote bank, um, customers, whatever it may be. That's a problem. So once that inhibition is gone, then we may be able to do something. And one of those ways, and I'm not saying, I'm not suggesting it, but, uh, and there are different versions of this. But one of the, the word that I want to use is a revolution. Uh, you, you need to change those institutions. You need to work with them, uh, demand from them that uh, um, you need to be more. Act I'm trying to be very delicate in, in the words that I'm trying to use. They need to be more active and more engaged in different issues. 
there was a time, again, with the greatest respect for anybody, it's from the MAB. MAB is the Muslim Associ Association of Britain. When I was young, uh, a long time ago, it, there was a joke uh, in, in, my, in my generation that MAB stood for the... It's a prime example of how the lawyer, the legal fraternity inside Kuwait started a campaign. Um, armed resistance. Um, good question. There is armed resistance inside Kashmir, undoubtedly. Um, I think it was the the head of the North India. I mean, talking about recently, recently there has been uh, a statement from the Indian forces that say that there's about a hundred armed rebels inside Kashmir. A hundred, dangerous, armed to the teeth. I mean, armed to the teeth means they've got about two pistols and an AK-47, while the Indian army has everything on the, at their disposal. One million, nearly, one million, and we have about a hundred. Um, let's say it's not a hundred, let's say it's, you know, three hundred. Let's say it's five hundred. Still doesn't warrant a million military personnel inside Kashmir. Um, what do they have, and when we talk about that, look, the average lifespan of an armed resistance fighter inside Kashmir is about 30 days. And they know this. They know this. They give their life for a particular reason, for a particular purpose. Now, some people may disagree with it, some people may agree with it. I'm not here to judge. What I'm explaining to you is that people are ready to give their lives for a cause. Knowing full well they don't have enough arms, they don't have enough ammunition, uh, and their lifespan is very limited. I mean, some have stayed for a few years, but on average. Do they have the right, the question is, do they have the right to resist? Yes. Show me where they don't have the right. There is, uh, uh, the United Nations Security Council specifically gives people the right to defend their lands. The right to defend their honor. The right to uh, not being uh, ousted from their homes. So, if the question is, is it legitimate? Absolutely. Uh, and if it isn't, go tell the United Nations first and then tell me. Um, and if there is a referendum, how would that work? We've always asked that when there is a, when there is a, um, a plebiscite, when, if and when the people of Kashmir will be given the right to self-determination, it has to be done under the UN, United Nations uh, observers. Now, the United Nations observer group exists inside Kashmir, but only to observe. Uh, they very rarely report anything. I've been to that office in 2016, when uh, there was a lot of violence happening inside Kashmir. Um, in fact, it was the last time I traveled to Kashmir, but I banged on their doors for about an hour. Nobody came. Then I went to, an, as an anecdote, I went to ICRC. Uh, no, not ICRC. It was uh, MSF, uh, Doctors Without Borders. I went to their office, banged on their door for about 20 minutes. And then the Jafrasi, uh, the, the peon, the, the t caretaker of the building, he came out and he said, well, what do you want? I said, well, where are the doctors? We've got people that are injured. We need to bring them out. He said, oh, they've already gone to Delhi. Why? Because they knew that it's going to, uh, it's going to be a problem in Kashmir. So they left for Delhi. My God, you're doctors. You're supposed to go to conflict zones. MSF, Medicine Sahab Khotel, Doctors Without Borders. You're supposed to go to these places and help people. But the moment they heard that there's going to be a problem inside Kashmir, they left. Um, so the other part in terms of who's qualified to vote if, if a referendum ever happened inside Kashmir, those people that had a state subject, those people not necessarily born inside Kashmir, but those people that are that have links to Kashmir. I, I'm, and I don't mean links by having issued domicile certificates that uh, uh, after Article 370, 35A. People that are genuinely Kashmir, they have the right. Um, in regards to ah, you asked about how information because websites are being banned and whatnot. There are groups and organisations and and. Um, you see, Stand with Kashmir um, may not be seen inside India, but Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, there are always people out there that may not necessarily show their real names um, and real organizations and real profiles, but there is an abundance of information. In the digital age, hashtag is such an amazing thing. Uh, it really is. That's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, but I will give you one name, um, or, or a couple of names. There are... For example, so JKCCS, the reports already exist. Print them out uh, or, or share them wherever you need. Kashmir Scholars Action Network, they exist as well. Um, I, to some extent, exist as long as I'm alive. Um, there are people all around the world, connect with them. Um, now, a lot of people may not openly speak to you because there is, and this is also important to know, 
communication lines inside Kashmir are, always, are all tapped, right? And uh, in the public sphere, to, to communicate openly and transparently, what happens is a lot of people get arrested and taken away. Um, I have friends that have been languishing in jail for God knows how many years for a tweet, one tweet. Uh, so many people's accounts have been have been observed, and that's why we have something called the cyber cell inside Kashmir, specifically targeting those people that are talking about resistance against India. Um, and in regards to uh, the gentleman's question, in uh, well, the point about laughing about Bangladesh, did anybody laugh at the atrocities that happened inside Bangladesh? No, no, no. no. We laughed at the question. So this was not I'm, I'm, if, if you allow me to complete, yes, as I yes, allowed sure. you to complete. Yes. We laughed at the context of that question. You want to learn? I'm, I'm going to educate you of why we laughed. We laughed at the context of the question. While I am speaking about Kashmir and Indian occupied Kashmir, whatever happened inside Bangladesh, East Pakistan, was, was abominable, ab abominable, abominable, abominable. But we're not here to speak about that. If you want to speak about that, please be my guest. And I will sit over there and I will ask the questions as well. And I will listen keenly. But why would you ask such a question? Or why would you divert the attention away from an issue of play any of those photos? Any of those photos. Why would you divert away? It's a rhetorical question. It's a, it's a rhetorical question. It's a rhetorical question. Why would you divert away from any of these people that we speak to? You cannot rhetoric say it's rhetoric question, sir. I woke up from this. Did you say it's Thank question you. is rhetoric? Bye. 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 By the way, by the way, I hope, I hope you get your salary. I hope you get your salary. Thank you. The embassy is just around the corner. We've got maybe five, seven questions. There's a question up here, two in the middle. So just take two. Can you ask your question? Yes. Um, Bursi, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. And, um, oh. Sorry, thank you for speaking to us. I want to say that famously, uh, MLK said that um, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice. Use the microphone, we can't hear you. Uh, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, and it is important that we discuss these issues just as important as it is to discuss Palestine. What advice do you have to us, uh, because we go to school with these people, and we have classes with these people, we share the same buildings. Do you think it's worth engaging in conversation? Uh, with people who, even when they're faced with the facts, they still deny. And uh, somebody already mentioned that there's a lot of uh, censorship in India, so I feel like LC is a good place to maybe discuss these things because you can show them evidence. Do you think that's worth it? And if you do, how would we go about it in a constructive way? Because clearly some people can't face what's uh, true. Okay, one more. So, Asalaamu Alaikum. My question as a Pakistani that uh, the freedom of Kashmir Azadi means Kashmir Banega Pakistan. And I want to ask you, what does freedom Azadi specifically mean to you as an individual? And we expect Muslim countries to unite and help in order to liberate Kashmir. But when you have Saudi Arabia strengthening their ties with Israel, when you fly from Abu Dhabi to Tel Aviv, how are we expecting Muslims to unite in order to liberate Kashmir? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the engagement question is a very good question, uh, as you witnessed that it's very difficult to talk to people that have already been um, force-fed the uh, Indian narrative. Um, you know, he walked out because he thought that I said that the gentleman's question was rhetorical. I was saying that my question was rhetorical. Yeah. Language is such an important thing, right? <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Um, engaging with Indians, I've stopped doing it, except when it's in, in, a, in an environment like this, um, or if it's in a, in, a, uh, in a lecture, or you know, whatever it may be. When it comes to my daily, I know I have a lot of Indian friends, not a lot, but I have some Indian friends, we don't talk politics, specifically Kashmir. We may talk about Ukraine, we may talk about anything else, but we don't talk Kashmir, simply because he knows he's not going to change my mind, and I know that he's got all that propaganda stuff between his ears, and it's not going to change. Um, 
it is, it is very difficult to reason with those people that have been raised in India with that narrative. Could you, look, um, for 20 years of your life, or 25, 30 years of your life, you're raised in a particular way, you're taught a particular thing. It is very difficult to change that perception. Um, so I don't blame them, but what I do expect is educated uh, people that are going to be qualified tomorrow, um, that are engaging with so many people from so many nationalities, should have an open mind. But if they clearly don't, why would we need them? For what? Which goes on to uh, the part in regards to what, what the gentleman said about talking about the Muslim nations. I don't. When I talk, when I say that we need to engage with other Muslims uh, and not necessarily with with the uh, the radical Hindutva right wing that want to eliminate the Muslims inside Kashmir, what I mean is I don't talk about governments. I talk about individuals. I talk about, for example. Uh, um, people from Palestine Society of all universities, from FOSIS, the Federation of Society of Islamic, uh, Federation of Students of Islamic Societies, all the ISOCs, all the Pakistan societies, all the government societies, uh, government um, and, and amnesties, you have so many different organizations, and tomorrow you people are going to be barristers, you're going to be uh, doctors, you're going to be, in whatever capacity you're going to be, you're going to be something, and you will know about Kashmir. And then in that capacity, you will do something. When it comes to uh, institutional level, Look, I, I pray to God that a lot of you go into public policy. I really do. It is, in my opinion, one of the most important subjects. Not necessarily for Kashmir, but as minorities, as people from the Bain community. It's necessary, and I know this is going off on a tangent. But if you want to change things, there are two ways. Either you try to break it from the outside, or you break it from the inside. And uh, um, young people will think that it's the, it's the uh, revolutionary way to do things that works, not always. It is a start, but eventually you have to put on a suit and tie and act like, an, uh, like, uh, act like a decent human being. Um, <laughs> what, do, what, do, what, what does freedom mean to me? Anything except India. <laughs> Honestly. There's just no scope to offer people an option of India when those people have been mutilated, subjugated, oppressed, murdered, raped, and forcibly disappeared, used as human shields. How is that an option? A lot of people will have this discussion that do people of Kashmir really want Pakistan? Do they maybe want complete independence? But that isn't the question. The question is, allow us to get to the stage, get to that position where we can decide our own future. That's it. After that, nakum dinakum wali. You, your path, me, my path. Oh. Alright, I think that's our time done. One more at the back, and that's it. Or maybe, it depends how much time you have left. Five minutes. I mean. Okay, we can take one more question, one more question, but not the same person twice. Okay, in the middle there. So recently on a trip uh, as a tourist to Kashmir, I was actually quite surprised at the amount of militant presence uh, military presence in, in the state. Uh, it, it was very unusual to me to see that at every 50 meters there was an armed officer and a gun and I can only imagine what it means for the mental health and, and the, the lives of people in the state and, and I'd like to hear a bit more uh, from you because um, I haven't heard about it at all. I've heard that health services in Kashmir are great the health outcomes are great as compared to many other states in India. And I don't think that's true. So I just want to hear from your perspective. If I may ask you, um, and you don't have to answer, don't, don't feel compelled to answer, are you from India? Yes, I am. What was the, just for the sake of the audience, what kind of knowledge base did you have about Kashmir before you actually visited Kashmir? I mean, I had taken the effort to learn more about it. So I did know about the history um, right from before independence as well as uh, during partition. So yes, I, I was informed of that. 
the mental health aspect is a really good question. Um, I think it was MSF that, maybe it was Amnesty, it, it escapes me right now, that 50% of people inside Kashmir suffer from mental trauma, 50%. And of the people that have been uh, to jail or witnessed crimes inside Kashmir, 80% suffer mental torture, uh, mental trauma. Essentially mean that everybody in a conflict zone, it doesn't necessarily have to be Kashmir, but anybody that is in a conflict zone is going to have some, some form of torture, uh, some form of mental trauma. I don't even live in Kashmir. I mean, I was there for, for, for a little while, for a few years, and I had PTSD. I'm, I'm happy to, to say that. I'm, I'm confident enough to say that, that I had PTSD for a while. The things that a person sees, having to bury your friends and relatives, some with seven limbs, uh, is not easy to deal with. Um, and it's become so normal for so many people now that they don't even recognize the violence that is being perpetuated on them. You know, they talk about, again, slight tangent, people talk about that racism is so rampant that people now minorities don't even recognize that racism because it's so normalized. It's the same thing with violence and conflict, that it becomes so normalized that you think that it's normal to see every 15 meters of military personnel. Now it's like the ambulances. Who, who notices the, the police sirens and the ambulance sirens? Nobody really notices them anymore because you just, it's just there. It's background noise. For us, these are background images. They fill up our day. We generate a hell of a lot of electricity, as I wish me. But 88% of it goes to India. We only get to keep 12%. And if we need more, we have to buy it back at a higher rate. But that's a different subject. Okay, so we've actually reached the end of the question. So thanks very much for the question. <laughs> I want to hand over, before we finish, I want to hand over to the society to have the last word. Firstly, Jazakallah Khairan for everything you've done today. May Allah continue to reward you for the work you do for Kashmir. Uh, and I uh, hope a lot of people here today will go on and they'll begin to speak about Kashmir. I think. The most important thing is that the conversation doesn't end here today, rather it starts. It's the first time that ISOC, PACSOC or any, any of these sort of societies has held a proper event on Kashmir. Uh, and I think it's very important that everyone who leaves here today, you begin to talk about Kashmir, you begin to do something. This event wasn't open to externals. Muzammar was telling me earlier how many Kashmiris were asking him if he could come in. The ISOC itself, we I'm had no getting of, messages from people. Still so, like, yeah, still. still the ISOC itself was getting bombarded as well. So we need to make sure that it's make sure that it's understood that so the same way we can have a Palestine event that's open to externals, we can have a Kashmir event that's open to externals. The same way we can have an event by the Uyghurs, the Rohingya, any of these other oppressed Muslims across the world, we can do the same with Kashmir. May Allah ease the suffering of our brothers and sisters in Kashmir. May he honour the women who have been disgraced and violated inside Kashmir. Amen. And may he, may he place honour on all our brothers and sisters who work towards ending oppression in, uh, across the Muslim world. Amen. Amen.